Hey everybody, welcome to the second part of my short series here on homebrewing. If you're just getting into homebrewing, be sure to check out the first video of this series, which I'll have a link to up here. In that video, I walk you through the typical steps that I take for a normal brew day. We brew two all grain recipes, one for a chocolate stout and another for a German Hefeweizen. In this video, we'll talk about the final two steps of the brewing process, which are fermentation and packaging. Now the hardest part with both of these steps is exercising patience because both of these steps take quite a bit of time. The fermentation process will take about a week or two, as will the packaging process. So even though you put a lot of energy and effort into getting your beers brewed, you still have to wait for quite a bit of time before you can actually fully enjoy them. But trust me, your patience will pay off in the end. So first, we'll talk about the fermentation process. Now fermentation begins when you first pitch your yeast into the fermenter, which we did at the end of our last video. Now in this fermentation process, the yeast is going to process all of the sugars that we extracted from our mash, and the yeast will create the byproducts of both alcohol and CO2. This will actually allow you to see the fermentation process in action, because you will see movement in either your airlock or blow-off tube as the CO2 is being generated and is expelled from the carboy. You'll see signs of vigorous fermentation within a day or two of pitching your yeast. So throughout the fermentation process, you can see how much activity there is in your airlock in order to determine how active your fermentation is. Within the first couple of days, you're gonna see a lot of bubbling in both the airlock and in your fermenter. You'll see a big layer of foam form on the top of your beer inside your fermenter called Kreuzen, and this is perfectly normal. In fact, some beers will actually ferment so heavily that this Kreuzen can actually overflow from your fermenter, and that's actually why I'll use a blow-off tube sometimes instead of a normal airlock. I think I mentioned this in my past video where normally the Hefeweizen yeast that I use has a very strong fermentation that often causes blowback. So I put the blow-off tube initially on my fermenter, but take a look and see what happened. So today's Monday. This is the second day for fermentation, and this is something I wasn't really anticipating. So normally, the Hefeweizen here tends to have more active fermentations than my other beers, and this one tends to have a blow-off, which is why I put the blow-off tube here, but actually, the stout is doing that. So you can see that the Kreuzen from the beer, the Kreuzen is sort of the foam that gets generated during fermentation. It's getting pushed up through the airlock rather than just the sanitizer. So I'm actually gonna try to switch these. And I'll see if I can take the blow off tube and put it onto this fermenter and then put, I'll clean this airlock out real quick and try to get it on here and just sort of monitor it. Okay, so I have a little sanitizing solution here. I'm gonna take the fermenter from the stout off and soak it in that solution to try to clean it out. Then I'll take the stopper off from here and that way the blow off tube I can move from this fermenter here onto this one. And then I'll put the fermenter in the solution back on the Hefeweizen fermenter. And then I'll just sort of keep track of it for the next couple of days to see if the Hefeweizen starts to blow off and then I'll have to switch them back if necessary. And there we go, so now the blow-off tube is on the fermenter for the stout. And I just have a traditional airlock on the Hefeweizen right now. I'll have to keep monitoring it because usually this Hefeweizen is the one that tends to have the blow-off, so that might just be when I'm using the Y yeast rather than the White Labs yeast, but we'll keep an eye on it and if necessary we'll change it back. Hopefully by then this stout will have died down a little bit, so I'm glad that I caught that because these blowovers can tend to make a really big mess in here. So you can see there's a little bit of spilled beer down there on the uh, bottom of the fermentation chamber, but that'll be easy to clean up. So we can close it up and let it continue running its course. So you can see that the Hefeweizen is still very active. Just luckily right now, the uh, Kreuzen is not coming up the neck right now. All right, so it's Monday night now. This is the blow-off tube from the chocolate stout. You can see it's uh, turning brown now. So the blow-off tube is doing its job. You can see it here. And now the Hefeweizen is bubbling quite often. There's still a little bit of space, but the Kreuzen is rising pretty quickly. I'm actually starting to get a little worried that that's also gonna need a blow-off tube. So I will check in the morning. If I need to, I actually do have a little tray I can put the other fermenter in. That'll just be 
easier to clean up. Okay, it's Tuesday now. I can still hear the blow off tube pumping good. So let's take a look at what we got now. So we're still getting pretty constant activity from the stout with the blow off tube. It doesn't look like there's too much foam running through the line anymore. And then with the Hefeweizen, it's definitely slowed down a bit, but it's still going pretty constantly. And it doesn't look like we're gonna have any problem with blow off from this beer. So I think we're gonna get lucky and our fermentation chamber isn't going to be too messy. So I'll just keep checking on this every day or so. I probably won't record any more segments because I don't think there's gonna be a lot more activity. So the next time you see this, we'll probably be getting ready to put in the chocolate extract into our chocolate stout here. That's right, I was a little surprised to see that I didn't need the blow off tube for the Hefeweizen, and I'm glad that I was able to switch it over to the stout in time to prevent a mess from being formed in my fermentation chamber. I'm using a standard chest freezer that's plugged into an external temperature controller. Basically, the freezer will only turn on when the temperature probe reads a temperature that is too high. And the purpose of this fermentation chamber is to try to control the temperature throughout the fermentation process. Now, you certainly do not need something this fancy in order to get started with brewing. The main two things that you're looking to control with your fermentation is how much light your beers are being exposed to, as well as the temperature range your beer is fermenting at, depending on its style. While your beer is fermenting, you want to expose it to as little light as possible, so you want to make sure to ferment your beers in a nice dark location. Before I had my fermentation chamber, I would actually just put my carboys inside of a nice dark closet. The temperature that you want your beers to ferment at is going to depend on the style of beer that you're brewing. Both beers that we're brewing in this series are ales, and for most ales you want to ferment typically between 60 and 70 degrees. If your apartment or house temperature is in that range, you can honestly just ferment inside your house. Whereas with lagers, you're trying to ferment a good deal colder, and you might actually need external equipment like a fermentation chamber to reach those temperatures. So for me, when I was just getting started with brewing, I had absolutely no problems with fermenting my beers in a nice dark closet. Now most of your fermentable sugars are going to be processed within the first three to five days of your fermentation, and this is called the primary fermentation stage. After this point, you have a decision to make on whether or not you want to transfer your beer to a secondary fermenter to allow it to continue its fermentation process, or are you going to leave your beer in the primary fermenter and allow it to finish in that container. You'll notice that as your beers are fermenting, a layer of solids and sediment is going to form at the bottom of your fermenter, and this is called trub. And this trub can cause off flavors if your beer is allowed to sit on it for too long. Because of this, homebrewers would traditionally transfer their beer from their primary fermenter into a secondary fermenter and leave all of that trub behind. However, one of the problems with transferring to a secondary fermenter is it can cause oxidation if you're not careful and do not avoid splashing, and it also offers an opportunity for bacteria or other germs to get in and infect your beers. For me personally, I haven't noticed many off flavors from allowing my beers to stay in the primary fermenter for about two weeks or so, so usually I choose to forego transferring to a secondary container and will allow all of my fermentation to take place in the single container. However, it may be a good idea to transfer to a secondary or even tertiary container if you're fermenting your beers for a longer period of time. Another good time to rack your beer to a secondary container is if you're adding additives like fruits or other ingredients that you want your beers to ferment with. I can see that if you're adding whole fruits into your fermenter that can cause a lot of splashing, so it's probably a better idea to put all of the other ingredients that you're going to be using into your secondary fermenter and then carefully siphon your beer from the primary fermenter into that secondary container to allow it to continue its fermentation. Now with the chocolate stout that we're brewing, we do need to add some chocolate extract, and the recipe recommends racking the beer on top of the extract in a secondary fermenter. But because I think I can pour this extract pretty carefully, and it's such a small amount, I think I'm gonna be okay just pouring it into the fermenter it's already in. Okay, so for our chocolate flavor, we are going to be using this chocolate extract from Olive Nation. I just got this off of Amazon. The recipe says we need one and a half ounces of extract for five gallons of beer. So we're gonna weigh this up. So to do that, I have a star sand solution here, and I have a little measuring cup that we're gonna to use to weigh and pour. So I'm sanitizing the measuring cup. Empty out as much as we can. And then we're gonna go ahead and put it on our scale. All right, so we wanna measure out one and a half ounces.
All right, there we go. So let's go ahead and pour this into our fermenter. Okay, so we're gonna take the airlock off. I'm gonna just set this in here because this is just sanitizer anyway. And we'll carefully pour in our extract. The airlock back on. Now that beer is ready to keep fermenting with the chocolate. Our chocolate stout still has some pretty good activity and I have now added the chocolate extract to allow it to ferment with that. But our Hefeweizen does look like it's coming to an end because there is very little activity in that airlock now. So the chocolate stout has certainly slowed down but there is still a little bit of fermentation activity. You can see that it's bubbling every five seconds or so. The Hefeweizen here, there's not much activity anymore and it slowed down a good deal yesterday as well. There's still a couple of bubbles here and there, but I think this one's actually pretty close to being finished. So I'm going to pull a sample and test it for its gravity, and we'll see if we're close to our estimated final gravity. Now, in order to verify that we've reached the end of our fermentation, we wanna make sure that all of the sugars have been processed. And to do that, we're gonna to need to take a couple of gravity readings. We're gonna pull out a sample today and we'll see if we're close to what Beersmith estimates as our final gravity. And then a couple of days later, we're gonna pull another sample and we're gonna see if their readings are the same. If they are, then we can pretty confidently say that we've reached our final gravity and we will then compare that to our original gravity to determine how much alcohol has been formed. And then we're ready to begin the packaging process. Now, if the readings are different, then we're gonna let it ferment a couple more days and we'll keep pulling samples every couple of days until we do find two samples that are the same. In order to collect the sample from my carboy, I'm gonna use this, and this is called a wine thief. So to use this wine thief, you're gonna simply sanitize it first, then you'll open up your carboy and stick the wine thief inside, cover the top with your thumb, and then pull it out, and you'll see a little bit of liquid collected in the bottom. Then we'll pour a drop of the beer on the refractometer and we'll see what our gravity is at. So let's get this thing sanitized. So our wine thief is sanitized. Let's go pull out our sample. All right, so to collect this sample, we're gonna take the airlock off first. We wanna be pretty quick about this. I'm gonna set the airlock in some sanitizer here. We're gonna take our wine thief, put it in, cover it up. Let's try it with a different, here we go and pull it out, and then there's our sample. Okay, so then we're gonna just put a couple of drops here on the refractometer. I put too much, there we go. And let's take our reading. So our refractometer says we're at about seven bricks, or maybe just a hair below. Now, if you take that seven bricks and put it into an online calculator to convert from bricks to standard gravity units, you're gonna get 1.028. And that's a bit high for our final gravity for this style. Beersmith actually estimates that our final gravity should be close to 1.012. So we are a good deal off. However, it's important to realize that the alcohol content of the beer is actually throwing the refractometer reading off a little bit. And because of that, we actually need to use a separate calculator to determine what our final gravity reading is. So there are a couple of online calculators that you can use, just search for a refractometer calculator. And what you're gonna need is you'll need your original gravity, either in bricks or standard gravity units, and then you'll also want your current reading. So our original gravity from when we were brewing was 12.5 bricks, so I'll put that in the original gravity section, and then I'll put in seven bricks for our current gravity reading now. And then this calculator is going to apply a correction factor, and it says that our final gravity is currently 1.015. So we're still a tiny bit off. I'm hoping for it to come a little bit lower. So we're gonna check back in a couple of days and we'll take another reading and see if we get closer to that value. Now, if you're using a traditional hydrometer like this, then you won't have to worry about applying that correction factor. The only thing you'll need to do is make sure you know the temperature of the beer that you're measuring. So that's all we have for today. We're gonna to continue to wait and let the beers finish fermenting and we'll check back in a couple of days to see if we're ready for packaging. All right. So it is now January 6th, and the Hefeweizen has been fermenting for 10 days now. I've pulled several samples over the past week, and my gravity readings have finally leveled off at 6.2 bricks. Using a refractometer calculator, this will put my final gravity at 1.010, which is very close to my estimated final gravity. 
You can also visually tell that fermentation is coming to an end because there's little to no activity in the airlock and the croissant that used to be high at the beginning of fermentation has now settled into the beer. At this point, you'll have a choice to make on how you want to finish the fermentation process. Most of the time, I will simply begin packaging at this stage, but many home brewers will cold crash their beer the day before packaging. Cold crashing involves lowering the temperature of your beer before packaging, which will cause any suspended solids in the fermenter to settle at the bottom. This will just make it easier to transfer clear beer from the fermenter into your bottles or kegs. Many home brewers may also add gelatin at this stage, which will further reduce suspended solids from being transferred into your final beer. In order to cold crash your beer, you will need a fermentation chamber and a temperature controller. The day before you're ready to package, you're going to lower the temperature of your beer to about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you'll simply let your beer sit at that temperature for about 24 hours before packaging. Now personally, I don't cold crash my beer in the fermenter because this cold crashing process also occurs within the first couple of days of kegging, which is what I do to package my beer. The first couple of pints I may pour off from my kegerator may have some suspended solids in it, but after a glass or two, the beer will typically clean up and I'll have a nice clean beer for the rest of that keg. So now that our fermentation is complete, we are ready to begin packaging this Hefeweizen. I've also taken a couple of gravity readings from the chocolate stout to see how close we are to finishing the fermentation for that beer, and I think I'll be able to keg that beer over the weekend. There are two primary ways to package your home brewed beer, bottling and kegging. When you're first getting started with home brewing, chances are you will be bottling your beers because the cost to entry is significantly lower than with kegging. Here's the equipment that I would recommend you get if you plan on bottling your beer. Obviously, you will need empty glass bottles and bottle caps. Glass bottles can be easily purchased, or you can wash and reuse empty glass bottles that you may have lying around at home. Just make sure that they're not screw top bottles, or you may end up getting a bad seal when capping. I would also recommend brown glass bottles like these over clear bottles. While your beer is conditioning in your bottles, you still want to expose it to as little light as possible, and that's just so much easier to do in these brown bottles. You'll also need your siphon and hose that we talked about in the first video of this series. As far as new equipment that you'll need, I would recommend picking up a plastic bucket like this with a spigot, as well as a bottling wand like this. This bottling wand will only open and allow beer to flow if you push the tip down into the bottom of the bottle, and this will just make the bottling process a lot less messy. Lastly, you'll need a bottle capper like this in order to securely seal your bottles once they've been filled. In order to carbonate your beers in the bottle, you're going to need one additional ingredient, priming sugar. Before you bottle, you're going to mix a small amount of this priming sugar with your beer. The yeast in your bottles will process that additional sugar and generate more CO2 and alcohol in the bottles. The amount of priming sugar you'll need is going to depend on the style of beer that you're brewing, but luckily there are calculators available online that you can use to determine how much sugar you'll need to properly carbonate your beer. You just want to be careful not to use too much priming sugar as this could cause your beers to overcarbonate, which could be dangerous. Overcarbonation can cause glass bottles to explode, so you do want to make sure to use the right amount of sugar. Because of these dangers, it's also very important to make sure that your fermentation is fully complete before you bottle your beer. Any unprocessed sugars in your fermenter could lead to overcarbonation in your bottles. Now I personally keg all of my beers, so I won't have any video clips showing this bottling process, but I can give you a quick walkthrough of what I used to do when I did bottle in the past. The first thing I do, regardless of if I'm bottling or kegging, is set the beer on the counter and allow it to rest for a couple of hours. If you look at the bottom of the fermenter, you'll see a layer of solids called trub. When I moved my fermenter from my fermentation chamber onto the counter, some of that trub does get loosened up and becomes suspended momentarily, so I like to allow my beer to rest on the counter for a couple of hours to allow all of those solids to settle at the bottom of the fermenter again. This just helps to transfer a nice clean beer into my final packaging, rather than pulling up some of those solids into my bottles or kegs. If it's light outside, I'll actually take a dark towel like this and wrap it around my fermenter. That way my beer is still not being overexposed to light. Now in order to bottle this beer, you're first going to want to clean and sanitize all of your bottles, your caps, and any equipment you're going to be using in the bottling process. To sanitize your bottles, you can simply soak them in a sanitizer solution with star sand and water, or what I used to do is actually stick all of my empty bottles into an empty dishwasher because my dishwasher has a sanitize option. So once everything is nice and sanitized, you're going to want to determine how much priming sugar you're going to need depending on the style of beer that you're brewing 
and you're going to dissolve that sugar in about a cup of boiling water. Once dissolved, you can then add the sugar and water mixture into your bottling bucket. Make sure that your spigot is closed if you don't want to spill any beer on your floor. Then you're going to take your siphon and carefully transfer the beer from the fermenter into the bottling bucket with the priming sugar. While doing this, you want to avoid splashing as much as possible as oxidizing the beer could cause off flavors to develop. You'll also want to try to avoid as much trub at the bottom as possible if you don't want any sediments floating around inside of your finished beer. Once you finish transferring your beer from the fermenter to your bottling bucket, you are now ready to begin filling your empty bottles using your bottling wand. To do that, you're going to want to connect your bottling wand to the spigot of your brewing bucket. Then you're simply going to open the spigot and insert the bottling wand into each bottle, being sure to press down on the bottom of the bottle, which will allow the beer to flow from the bucket into the wand and into the bottle. When the bottle has been filled to your desired level, simply raise your bottling wand up and that will stop the flow into the bottle. You do want to make sure to leave a little headspace at the top of the bottle. Once all of your bottles have been filled, you can take your sanitized bottle caps, put them on top of the bottles, and then use your bottle capper to fully seal the beer. And that's it. It's gonna take about two to three weeks for your beers to fully carbonate in the bottles. During this time, you wanna keep them at room temperature in a nice dark location. Because I'm pretty impatient, I would begin checking carbonation after about a week. And once you feel like the carbonation is at a good level, then you can begin putting your bottles into the refrigerator to chill before enjoying. So after about a year of home brewing, I got pretty tired of cleaning, sanitizing, and filling empty bottles every time I was ready to package my beer. So I switched over to kegging all of my home brews. Now kegging does require a lot more specialty equipment, and that can be pretty pricey up front, but there are some pretty great benefits to kegging over bottling. When you keg, you'll always be in control of your carbonation level, so you'll never have to worry about measuring specific amounts of priming sugar. With kegging, you also no longer have to worry about the dangers of overcarbonation because the kegs are able to withstand a significant higher amount of pressure. Kegging also means you'll only need to clean, sanitize, and fill one container rather than several empty containers when you're ready to package. And lastly, there's just something that's so satisfying about pouring your own draft beer at home. So like I said before, you will need some specialty equipment to get started with kegging. First, you will need a CO2 tank with a pressure regulator. This is what you're going to use to provide CO2 to your beer rather than using priming sugar. The regulator can be adjusted to increase or decrease the amount of CO2 that's being sent to your kegs. The amount of CO2 that you want in your beer is going to depend on the style of beer that you're brewing. Again, there are plenty of resources available online that you can use to help you determine what to set your pressure regulator to in order to properly carbonate your beer. It's also possible to use secondary regulators in order to send specific amounts of CO2 to different kegs if you have a multi-keg setup. These secondary regulators will be able to dial in different pressures per keg, depending on how many regulators you use. Now I'm actually planning on recording another video in this series that will show how my 4-tap kegerator is set up, and I will discuss secondary regulators in that video in further detail. So be sure to subscribe to this channel if you would like to get notified when that video gets released. In addition to the CO2 tank, you will obviously need a keg. Now you may be able to find used five gallon kegs like this, or many homebrew stores and online stores will sell new kegs as well. You'll also need CO2 and beverage hoses and fittings in order to connect your CO2 tank to your keg and to dispense the beer from your keg. Now most beer lines will use hoses that have an inner diameter of 3 16ths of an inch, and you'll want to make sure that your lines are the right length to get a good flow of beer that won't cause too much foam to form while pouring. I'll get into this a little bit more with that kegerator video that I mentioned a little bit earlier, so be sure to check that video out for more information. Lastly, you'll need a place to store and cool your kegs. If you're simply planning on dispensing your beer from a party tap, you may be able to store your entire kegging setup in an upright refrigerator that has had its shelves removed. Or you may want to look into converting a fridge or freezer into a custom kegerator. Now there are plenty of resources available online to give you ideas for how to do this, and again, I will be uploading a video very soon showing my personal setup, and that will include photos documenting how I built my kegerator. Now the kegging process is very similar to the bottling process. I'm still going to rest my fermenter here on the counter for a couple of hours to allow any loose solids to settle before I'm ready to keg. At this time, I'm also gonna wash all of my kegs to make sure that there's no residue from any of the beers that were previously in the kegs. 
So to wash all of my kegs and really all of my brewing equipment, I use OxyClean. I find that an overnight soak in OxyClean is enough to remove even the toughest of messes, including all of this gunk that's settled on top of my fermenters. And it's significantly cheaper than other popular brewery cleaners like PBW. Just be sure to use OxyClean free because this doesn't have any fragrances added in. When I'm done soaking the keg in OxyClean, I'll also connect the keg to my kegerator in order to flush some of the lines with this cleaning solution as well. You may also want to remove the lid and the post from your keg and allow them to soak in an OxyClean solution as well. So once I'm ready to package, I'll empty the cleaner from the keg and rinse out any residual cleaner left in using my sink. Now OxyClean is very slippery to the touch, so it's pretty easy to see once you've rinsed out all of the cleaner from the keg. Then I'm going to sanitize my keg using Star Sand. I'll add a little bit of sanitizer to the keg and then about a gallon of water, and then I will vigorously shake the keg trying to make sure I get some sanitizer on all of the internal surfaces. I will then again connect my keg to my kegerator in order to flush out the cleaner that's previously in the line and allow the lines to come in contact with the sanitizing solution as well. So once the keg is sanitized, I will again remove the lid and the post from the keg and allow it to soak in some star sand solution as well. At this time, I'll also begin sanitizing my siphon. So once all of my equipment is sanitized, it's time to siphon the beer from the fermenter and into my keg. As with bottling, you're gonna to want to avoid splashing as much as possible and also avoid transferring the trub that's settled at the bottom of the fermenter. As you're filling your kegs, you may also notice that there's a lot of foam getting pushed out from the top of your keg, and this is perfectly normal. Don't worry about this foam, it's not going to add any off flavors to your finished beer, and it also won't water your beer down. Once the keg is full, You'll then replace the sanitized fittings and the lid and connect your keg to your CO2 line at your kegerator. I like to burp my kegs a few times by quickly opening and closing the pressure relief valve in order to remove any oxygen from the headspace in the keg. One last thing that I would recommend is that once you get your keg connected to your kegerator, you may want to brush soap and water around the seals for the lid and for the posts to make sure that there aren't any CO2 leaks. Lastly, I'll connect the keg to the kegerator and open the tap for a few seconds to flush out the sanitizer. And that's it. All that's left to do is allow the keg to cool and carbonate. I carbonate all of my kegs using the set and forget method where I have my regulator dialed into my desired carbonation level. It'll take about two weeks for your beers to fully carbonate with this method. So if you are impatient, there are methods for carbonating quicker. These methods typically involve setting your regulator to a higher pressure for a few days and then lowering your regulator to your serving pressure a little bit later. But I prefer to do as little as possible and I'm fine waiting for a couple of weeks to allow my beers to carbonate. So I'll usually set my regulator to about 10 to 12 PSI and just let it come up to its full carbonation when it's ready. So that's all for this video. I hope you found this series informative and I've had a lot of fun recording these videos. I'm super excited to try both of these beers in a couple of weeks and I'm sure I'll get a quick video where I taste test both of them. If you enjoyed these videos and would like to see more homebrewing content, be sure to leave me a comment below. If you haven't yet, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel as both of these actions are greatly appreciated and will help the channel grow. Thank you all so much for watching this video and until next time, cheers.